meets this morning to receive testimony on the posture of U.S. Central <laughs> Command in Africa. Command, we're pleased to welcome our witnesses, General Votel and General Waldheiser. Hauser, we thank each of you for your decades of distinguished service and for your leadership of our men and women in uniform. More than a decade and a half since the September 11th terrorist attacks, our nation is still at war with terrorists that seek to attack our homeland, our interests, our allies, and our partners in this fight. Our military service members are doing everything we ask of them from North Africa to the Middle East to South Asia. Thanks to their tremendous talent and dedication, we have made important tactical and operational progress. Our military has gradually eroded ISIS's territorial control and removed key personnel from the battlefield. ISIS has been expelled from its Libyan stronghold in CERT, and I am confident that soon the same will be true in Mosul and Raqqa. Our military has kept up the pressure on terrorists operating in countries like Yemen and Somalia. And in Afghanistan, we've kept al-Qaeda on the run and helped our Afghan partners hold the line against renewed Taliban assaults. But much to the frustration of the American people, this hard-won tactical progress has not led to enduring strategic gains. In fact, the sad reality is America's strategic position in the Middle East is weaker today than it was eight years ago. And the positions of Vladimir Putin's Russia and Iranian regime and its terrorist proxies have improved. This is not a military failure. Instead, it is a failure of strategy, a failure of policy, and most of all, a failure of leadership. The fact is, for at least the last eight years, we have tried to isolate the fight against terrorism from its geopolitical context. Or as General Mattis put it two years ago, we've been living in a, quote, strategy-free environment, unquote, for quite some time. The result is that we have failed to address and at times exacerbated the underlying conflict, the struggles for power and sectarian identity now raging across the Middle East. We've been unable or unwilling to either ask or answer basic questions about American policy in the region. We've been reluctant to act, and when compelled to do so, we have pursued only the most limited and incremental actions. We are fighting ISIS in Syria but ignoring the Syrian civil war that was its, ge its genesis and fuels it to this day. We're fighting ISIS in Iraq, but failing to address the growing influence of Iran. We're fighting Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, but pretending the Taliban is no longer our problem. We're fighting Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen, but refraining from confronting the threat posed by Iran's Houthi proxies. In short, we're treating the symptoms and ignoring the disease, and we should not be surprised at the results. A Middle East aflame, America's influence squandered, America's adversaries emboldened, America's friends disheartened, and America's policy options narrowed and worsened. This is the unfortunate inheritance of the new administration. Yet as difficult and complex as our challenges are in the Middle East, we have an opportunity to chart a new and different course. Seizing this opportunity will require more than just a plan for the accelerated defeat of ISIS. We have to raise our sights, look beyond the tactical and operational fight, and start answering some basic but difficult strategic questions. What enduring objectives do we hope to achieve across the Middle East? How will we achieve those goals? And on what timeline? And at what cost? In Iraq, Mosul will be retaken eventually, but that will only likely reignite the battle for the future of Iraq, a battle in which we have an important stake. What is America's policy and strategy to deal with the problems that lie ahead, combating the malign influence of Iran and its militias, addressing the future of the Kurds and their place in Iraq, and attenuating the, disenfranch the disenfranchisement of Sunni Iraqis that give rise to ISIS in the first place. Likewise in Syria. I believe Raqqa will eventually be liberated. But the closer we come to that day, the more it becomes clear that we cannot avoid difficult questions about Syria any longer. What is America's policy and strategy concerning a political transition in Syria? The future of Assad and his regime? The fate of the Kurds in Syria? and the influence of extremist forces from Sunni terrorists to Iranian-backed militias. In short, what is America's vision of an in-state in Syria? 
In Libya, the ISIS strong stronghold in Sirte has been degraded, but what remains is a divided nation littered with independent militias, flooded with arms, and searching in vain for legitimate governance and political unity. What is America's policy and strategy for addressing these conditions, which unless confronted, will make Libya fertile ground for extremism and anti-Western terrorism? In Afghanistan, we have settled for a strategy of don't lose. And the result is that last month, General Nicholson testified before this committee that this war is now in a stalemate after 15 years of fighting. After 15 years of fighting, we're in a stalemate. What is America's policy and strategy for rolling back a resurgent Taliban, addressing the terrorist sanctions within Pakistan's borders, and pushing back against Iranian and Russian meddling? In short, what does victory look like in Afghanistan, and what is our strategy for achieving it? Across the region, Russian and Iranian influence is growing at America's expense. Russia and Iran even hosted Syrian peace talks in Moscow last year without America present at the table. Russia's cruise missiles crisscross the region while its aircraft indiscriminately target Syrian civilians. Iran's proxies yield, wield lethal rockets and ballistic missiles with impunity. Sensing that the nuclear shield from <clears throat> that the nuclear deal shield him from American pressure, what is America's policy and strategy to counter Russian and Iranian malign influence that often manifests itself below the threshold of open conflict? How do we restore the trust of our regional allies and partners, and convince them to forego hedging strategies that only add to uncertainty and instability? These are the major policy and strategy questions hanging in the balance. The stakes are high, not just for the stability of the Middle East and Africa, but for America's national security. It is not the job of our witnesses to provide answers to these questions. That is the job of the President, his administration, and the Congress. We owe our witnesses and the men and women they lead unambiguous national security priorities, clarity in our strategic thinking, and an unwavering commitment to provide them the resources required to support the necessary courses of action. Once again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before the committee today and look forward to hearing how the military efforts will help us achieve favorable strategic outcomes. Senator Reid. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses, um, not only for your appearance here today, but for your extraordinary service to the nation over many, many years, and also please re relay our thanks to the men and women that you lead, and we appreciate their efforts extraordinarily. So uh, you are in a situation of very challenging times in er all the areas of operation. This hearing is especially timely given the unfolding events on the ground in Iraq and Syria and reported completion of a proposed strategy to accelerate efforts against ISIS. Our assistance to partners on the ground is helping them to make steady progress and reclaim the areas of Iraq and Syria once held by ISIS, most notably in Mosul. However, the situation in Syria seems to get more complicated by the day as different actors on the ground pursue diversion goals. Russia's continued support for the Assad regime fuels the country's civil war, enables the abuse and killing of Syrian population, and allows ISIS to exploit the resulting instability for its own gains. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, met with his Russian and Turkish counterparts just this week to discuss deconflicting operations in Syria, a battle space that has become increasingly complicated as U.S., Turkish, Russian, Iranian, Assad regime, and local partner forces converge in northern Syria. And General Votel, we look forward to your update on these particular issues. According to the public reports, the Defense Department has presented the White House with a draft strategy to accelerate progress against ISIS. While details of the strategy have not been publicly released, reports indicate that it retains many of the core elements of the strategy put in place under the Obama administration. General Dunford has described the strategy as a, quote, political military plan and, quote, a whole-of-government approach requiring important contributions from other non-DOD departments and agencies most notably the State Department. And this is why it is so concerning to me that the Trump administration's budget would apparently cut the State Department by a reported 37 percent 
at the very time that we need a surge of diplomatic and other assistance efforts to achieve the political conditions necessary to ultimately prevail in our fight against ISIS. As then General and now Secretary of Defense Mattis warned this committee, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition. We just can't keep buying bullets as the Trump administration is proposing. General Waldhauser, the importance of a robust interagency is perhaps of even greater importance in your area of responsibility, where you are primarily working by, with, and through partner military forces in conjunction with U.S. interagency efforts. General, as you share your assessment of current and future AFRICOM efforts in places like Libya and Somalia, I look forward to hearing ways you are incorporating a whole-of-government approach into your planning. Such incorporation is particularly important in places like these, where conflict resolution will ultimately rely less on the military toolkit and more on generating the proper political conditions to sustain and build upon security gains. Turning back to the CENTCOM AOR, over the last few years there has been a persistent focus on Iran's nuclear program, and appropriately so. We passed the one-year anniversary of the implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, in January, and Iran appears to be living up to its commitments under this agreement. However, the JCPOA only addresses one facet of the challenge posed by Iran. It's destabilizing activities in the region, ballistic missile development efforts, and unprofessional and dangerous behavior in the maritime environment continue. Sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program were successful because of the extraordinary unity within the international community. We must approach the remaining challenges in a similar way if we are to be successful in changing Iran's behavior. Any new sanctions must be carefully applied in concert with our international partners so that we do not give Iran a pretext to withdraw from the JCPOA and risk reversing the progress that has been made on limiting their nuclear ambitions. Last month, as the Chairman indicated, General Mick Nicholson, Commander of Resolute Support in U.S. Forces Afghanistan, testified that despite significant security gains and political efforts, Afghanistan is currently facing a stalemate. Further complicating the security landscape are the range of external actors, including Iran, Russia, and Pakistan, who seem intent upon interfering with the stability in Afghanistan. It was General Nicholson's assessment that increased troop levels for the NATO train, advise, and assist mission, as well as the continued growth in the size and capability of the Afghan Air Force, would be necessary to break the stalemate. General Botel, the committee would benefit from hearing your assessment of the current situation in Afghanistan and what can be done to protect the hard-won progress that has been achieved and ensure that further progress is made. Again, thank you both for your continued service to the nation, and I look forward to your testimony. I welcome the witnesses, and your written statements will be made part of the record. We'll begin with you, General Votel, and welcome, and thanks for your service that you both rendered to our nation. Chairman McCain, Ranking Member Reed, distinguished members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the current posture and state of readiness of the United States Central Command. I'm very pleased to appear today with my good friend and highly respected brother-in-arms, General Tom Waldhauser. I come before you today on behalf of the outstanding men and women of the command, military, civilians, and contractors, along with our coalition partners representing nearly 60 nations. Our people are the very best in the world at what they do, and I could not be more proud of them and their families. Without question, they are the strength of our central command team. I've been in command of CENTCOM for about a year now. It has been an incredibly busy and productive period. Over the past 12 months, we have dealt with a number of significant challenges in Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Egypt and the Sinai, the Bab el-Mendeb Strait, and elsewhere throughout our area of responsibility. We are making progress in many areas, but as you know, there is much left, there is much work that remains. We are also dealing with a range of malign activities perpetrated by Iran and its proxies operating in the region. It is my view that Iran poses the greatest long-term threat to stability for this part of the world. Generally speaking, the central region remains a highly complex area, widely characterized by pervasive instability and conflict. The fragile security environments, which reflect a variety of contributing factors, including heightened ethno-sectarian tensions, economic uncertainty, weak or corrupt governance, civil wars, and humanitarian crises, are exploited by violent extremist organizations and terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. These groups have clearly indicated their desire and intent to attack the U.S. homeland, our interests abroad, and the interests of our partners and allies. At the same time, 
the central region is increasingly crowded with external nation states, such as Russia and China, and they are pursuing their own interests and attempting to shift alliances. The point that I would emphasize to you is this, that while there may be other more strategic or consequential threats or regions in the world today, the central region has come to represent the nexus for many of the security challenges our nation faces. And most importantly, the threats in this region continue to pose the most direct threat to the U.S. homeland and the global economy. Thus, it must remain a priority and be resourced and supported accordingly. The team at U.S. Central Command remains appropriately focused on doing what is necessary to protect our national interests and those of our partners. Our strategic approach is straightforward. Prepare, pursue, and prevail. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We prepare the environment to ensure an effective posture. We actively pursue opportunities to strengthen relationships and support our interests. And when we do put our forces into action, we prevail in our assigned missions. I would also point out to you to that today, to the credit and professionalism of our armed forces and coalition partners, we are exe executing campaigns in the central region with significantly fewer U.S. forces on the ground than in previous years. As you are seeing clearly demonstrated in Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, and elsewhere throughout our area of responsibility, we have adopted a by, with, and through approach that places a heavy reliance on indigenous forces. While this approach does present some challenges and can be more time consuming, it is proving effective and is likely to pay significant dividends going forward. Indigenous force partners continue to build needed capability and capacity, and they are personally invested in the conduct of operations and thus inclined to do what is necessary to preserve the gains they've achieved going forward. We also have a vested interest in ensuring increased stability and security in the strategically important central region. To this end, I will close by highlighting three areas where I do believe if we apply the appropriate amount of energy and effort, we can and will have a lasting impact in this part of the world. First, we must restore trust with our partners in the region while at the same time maintaining the strong trust of our leadership here in Washington. The fact is, we cannot surge trust in times of crisis, and we must do what is necessary now to assure our partners of our commitment and our staying power. Second, we must link our military objectives and campaigns as closely as possible to our policy objectives and our other instruments of national power. In other words, we must align our military objectives and our soft power capability with desired national and regional strategic end states, recognizing that if we don't do this, we risk creating space for our adversaries to achieve their strategic aims. Finally, we must make sure that we are postured for purpose in the region. We must have credible, ready, and present force coupled with foreign military sales and foreign military financing programs that serve to build and shape partner nations' capability in a timely and effective fashion. Ours is a challenging and important mission. Much is at stake today in the central region. We recognize this fact, and I assure you that the CENTCOM team stands ready and willing to do what is necessary to protect our national interests and the interests of our allies and partners. Let me close by thanking the committee for the strong support that you continue to provide to the world-class team at United States Central Command, and particularly to our forces located forward in the region. As I said at the outset, the 80,000-plus soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and civilians that make up the command are truly the very best in the world at what they do, and I could not be more proud of them and their families. I know that you are proud of them as well. Thank you again, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. General Waldhauser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McCain, Ranking Member Reed, and distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to update you on the activities and efforts of United States Africa Command. I'd also like to also say I'm, it's an honor for me to sit next to my battle buddy here, General Votel. For the past nine months, I have been honored to lead the men and women of this geographic combatant command. Africa is an enduring interest for the United States. Small, but wise investments in the capability, legitimacy, and accountability of African defense institutions offer disproportionate benefits to America, our allies, the United States, and most importantly, enable African solutions to African problems. Parts of Africa remain a battleground between ideologies, interests, and values. Equality, prosperity, and peace 
are often pitted against extremism, oppression, and conflict. Today, transregional violent extremist organizations on the continent constitute the most direct security threat to the United States. To address this threat, our military strategy articulates a long-term, regionally focused approach for a safe and stable Africa. Specifically, the strategy outlines an Africa in which regional organization and states are willing and capable partners addressing African security challenges, all while promoting United States interests. The Africa Command strategy builds our partners' abilities to direct, manage, and operate capable and sustainable defense institutions. While we have achieved progress in implementing our strategy, threats and challenges still remain. In East Africa, we support African Union and European Union efforts to neutralize al-Shabaab and other violent extremist organizations operating in Somalia. And we also support the eventual transfer of security responsibilities from the African Union mission in Somalia to the Somali National Security Forces. In 2016, al-Shabaab regained some previously held Somalia territory, and today the group continues to conduct attacks on Amisom forces, the national security forces of Somalia, as well as the federal government of Somalia. Additionally, we have also seen elements of ISIS begin to make inroads into Somalia, which will further test Amisom forces and the federal government of Somalia as well. The instability in Libya and North Africa, caused by years of political infighting, may be the most significant near-term threat to the U.S. and allies' interests on the continent. Stability in Libya is a long-term proposition. We must maintain pressure on the ISIS-Libya network and concurrently support Libya's efforts to reestablish a legitimate and unified government. This is a significant challenge, and we must carefully choose where and with whom we work and support in order to counter ISIS-Libya and not to shift the balance between various factions and risk sparking greater conflict in Libya. In West Africa, our primary focus is countering and degrading Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa. Since 2011, Boko Haram has consistently carried out attacks against civilians and targeted partner regional governments and military forces in the Lake Chad Basin region. With forces from Benin, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria, we are working with the multinational joint task force located in Niger to enable regional cooperation and expand partner capacity to ensure Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa do not further destabilize the region. The multinational joint task force has been successful in enabling multinational cooperation and coordina coordinating multinational operations and placed significant pressure on Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa. In Central Africa, through the combined efforts of military forces, civilian agencies, and non-governmental organizations, we work to build the capacity of our partners to address regional threats such as maritime security, illicit trafficking of goods and persons, the Lord's Resistance Army, and other criminal networks and enterprises. Africa-wide, we support the efforts to enable African partners to respond to humanitarian crises, mass atrocities, disaster contingencies, and to support peace operations. Through the United States National Guard's state partnership program, along with their Afri par African partners, we've improved disaster management competency and readiness to assist civilian-led efforts. We continue to see great value in the National Guard's persistent engagement and fully support the state partnership program's efforts. Africa's security environment is dynamic and complex, requiring innovative solutions. And even with limited resources or capabilities, Africa Command aggressively works with partners and allies to execute our missions and mitigate risk. Moving forward, we continue to focus our decisive effort on building African partner capacity and will continue to work closely with the international and interagency partners to make small, wise investments which pay huge, huge dividends in building stable and effective governments, the foundation for long-term security in Africa. I'm confident with your support, Africa Command will protect and promote United States interests and keep the United States safe from threats emanating from the African continent. And finally, on behalf of the United States Africa Command, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning 
and I also look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. Um, General Votel, uh, you agree that we're in a stalemate in Afghanistan after 15 years? Mr. Chairman, I do. And in some measurements, maybe you could uh, argue that when we go from control of 72 percent of the country to 52 percent, uh, that's worse than a stalemate. Would you agree that one of the most disturbing things about the attack on the hospital yesterday, that attack was carried out by ISIS, not, not by the Taliban, which shows, uh, at least to this person, that we are seeing an increase in influence of ISIS as well as uh, a Russian uh, providing weapons and the Iranians playing a greater role role than in the past. I guess my question is, are we developing a strategy to break this stalemate, and is it going to require additional U.S. troops? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the answer to the question is yes, we are developing a strategy, and we are in discussions with the, with the uh, Secretary and the Department right now. Uh, both General Nicholson and I are, are, uh, are forming our best advice and recommendations to the Secretary, and we look forward to moving forward with that. I do believe it will involve uh, additional forces to ensure that we can uh, uh, make the advise and assist mission more, more effective. And uh, already you have received uh, a capability on rules of engagement which enhance your abilities to combat uh, the enemy. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Um, we've got a very interesting and challenging situation in uh, Syria. And that is the whole issue of the Kurds, our relationship with them, Erdogan's a relationship with them, the importance of the use of Insulik, the importance of our relationship with uh, Turkey. Uh, and I met with President Erdogan in Ankara recently. He is passionately opposed to Kurdish uh, involvement and uh, our support of the Kurds that I understand are going to be a very vital element in expediting the retaking of, uh, of Raqqa. This is a complex situation, and it would take all my time, as you know, to go through all this. But I think there's a possibility of an impending conflict between mm -hmm. Turkey and the Kurds as opposed uh, to us all working together to try to defeat ISIS and remove them from Raqqa. Do you see that as a scenario that we should be concerned about? I, I do, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to that end, we are trying to take act actions to, to prevent that from occurring. Well, we find ourselves in a kind of a strange situation that we and the Russians are uh, allied against uh, uh, the Turks. Is that a correct, as far as the Kurds are concerned, is that a correct assessment? I, I wouldn't necessarily say that we are aligned against the, uh, against the Turks. Uh, we certainly understand what their interests are, and we understand their concerns about the partners that we are working with. Turkey is a vital partner in this effort here. We could not do what we're doing without them. <clears throat> so our efforts are to try to, try to work through this, uh, work through this tension, through dialogue, through information, and through identifying alternatives that uh, give us a way to uh, move forward against ISIS without... Uh, damaging the long-term relationship with a NATO partner. Well, as you know, we are working with an, with the Kurds that and arming and training them, and they are a very effective fighting force. The same Kurds that uh, Erdogan has labeled as a terrorist organization, and in the view of some, a greater threat to Turkey uh, than uh, than ISIS is. Uh, who, who's who's going to sort all this out? Well, uh, I, th I think there has to be a, there has, certainly has to be an effort, uh, Mr. Chairman, at the military level, and there has to be an effort at the political level to to address this. And so, as I, I, I'm not sure there's an understanding of how seriously Erdogan uh, views this issue, and I'm not sure we appreciate the importance of of the role that Turkey plays in our effort to retake Raqqa, uh, particularly in the use of Insulik and other activities that require uh, Turkish cooperation. I hope that we can, uh, uh, unless something changes, I foresee a train wreck here. 
and I'm not sure that the administration recognizes how seriously, particularly President Erdogan views the threat that he views uh, that the Kurdish, uh, that the Kurds uh, pose. Frankly, uh, finally, General Waldhauser, let, let's talk about Libya a second. Who's the most powerful influence in Libya today? And uh, what, what's, uh, briefly, what's the answer to this, uh, to this chaos? Thank you, Senator. It's difficult to say who's the most powerful partner right now inside Libya. If you took polls, you would see that the Libyan National Army has got great support in the West, or, I'm sorry, in the East, and the GNA has support uh, in the West. So there needs to be a combination of those two uh, organizations in order to get to a political, uh, political uh, solution there. Does it bother you that uh, Haftar has been visiting with the Russians and went out to a Russian carrier and uh, obviously now the Russians may be uh, assuming a role in Libya that they never had before? It is very concerning, Senator. Haftar has visited, as you said, on the carrier with the Russians. He's also vi visited in the country of Russia. Also this week, as is, is in, reported in the open press, Siraj from the Government of National Accord has also visited Russia. As is the case with Afghanistan that I mentioned, I hope we will be developing a strategy uh, as regards to Libya as the volatility of that situation can clearly lead to the rise of ISIS and other extremist organizations, as I know you are well aware, General. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Votel. Uh, you are now in the process of evaluating the, the mission and the strategy. And for many years, the mission seemed to be very clear with respect to Syria and to Iraq of de degrade and defeat ISIS. Now there are activities, particularly around Manbij, where you are in the process of trying to separate forces. The issue here really is uh, not only defining the mission, but preventing mission creep in terms of starting to find ourselves committed not just to destroying <laughs> ISIS, but to uh, somehow refereeing a very complicated situation with Russians, Assad forces, anti-Assad forces, Turkish forces, Kurdish forces, and an array of other forces that are, you, you can allude to. Uh, how are you going to prevent that uh, mission creep, or is there that possibility? Well, thank you, Senator. And, and uh, yes, I, I, I do agree. If we're, if we're not careful, we could find ourselves uh, in a different situation. Uh, the presence of our forces in, in Manbij is, is not new to just the current situation. They have actually been on the ground since, since Manbij was secured here uh, six or seven months ago. Uh, and they are principally there to ensure that ISIS uh, is not able to uh, uh, reestablish itself in the area. And, and we have undertaken a number of operations in that particular uh, regard. A as the situation is currently played out, uh, that is the principal focus of our, of our elements there. They do have the benefit by virtue of being there uh, to also provide overwatch and, the sh and, the sh and I, would, uh, I would add a measure of assurance, not just for our local partners on the ground there, but I would also suggest for our Turkish partners. We understand what their concerns are about undue Kurdish influence in this particular area. So the best way that we can uh, keep an eye on that, I think, is through our, our well-trained soft forces on the ground. Uh, one of the um, areas I touched upon in my comments was the interagency. And General Walthauser, uh, can you accomplish your mission in AFRICOM if you don't have rather robust support by State Department and other agencies, including our European allies? The short answer, Senator, is no, we cannot. We work very closely with various agencies, UAI, USAID, the State Department, and the like. And I could give numerous examples, if you like, of what, how we partner with them and how they contribute to development, which is so important, so important in our mission. Thank you. And uh, General Votel, likewise, in your uh, office. I absolutely agree. Uh, as we uh, go forward in terms of uh, the new strategy that the President is asking for, one point he made was requesting recommendation, recommendations to changes to any U.S. rules of engagement and other U.S. policy restrictions that exceed the requirements of an international war. Um, my sense is that the requirements and the authorities that the military has asked for is, is one, one, they can do the job, but two, they also do things like minimize civilian casualties, uh, provide for an appropriate relationship with the local 
uh, populations, which helps you rather than hurts you. And um, is that still the sensitivity that you have? I mean, adherence to the minimum international law might not be the smartest military approach. Well, we, we conduct all of our operations, of course, in accordance with the law of armed conflict, right. and uh, we, we bring our values to the, to the fight wherever, wherever we are. Uh, I, am, uh, I, I don't think those are our particular limitations on us at this particular point. Uh, my advice here moving forward has been to ensure that we, our forces have the operational agility to maintain pressure and sustain our, our approach of presenting ISIS with multiple dilemmas. Uh, and uh, and really pursuing an, uh, a, a military strategy of simultaneous operations to really overwhelm them quickly. And so the preponderance of our discussions and our recommendations really fell within that area. Uh, but it, again, uh, the rules that we've adopted have been based on best military policy, not just adherence to arbitrary rules. We, you know, we minimize casualties because it has an effect on the population that will hurt our operations. Is that correct? Senator, that is absolutely correct. 750,000 people in the west portion of, uh, of Mosul. And so we have to, we, we certainly have to conduct our operations with the full knowledge that that's the situation. Uh, again, gentlemen, thank you for your service and I look forward to continuing these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Waldhauser, we just, uh, as you and I discussed in my office, uh, Senator Rounds and I just uh, returned from uh, several areas in in, uh, in your command. And, uh, you know, when you stop and look at it, it's, uh, I, it, it's, it seems like it's been shorter than that, but it's been 10 years since we started AFRICOM. And AFRICOM used, to, the, the continent used to be divided in three different uh, commands. Now, since that time, I think there is, we've had a lot of successes. Uh, General Rodriguez, one of your uh, uh, predecessors, said, Africa is an enduring interest to the United States and its importance will continue to increase as African economies, population, and influence uh, grow. Do you agree with that statement? Senator, I do. And um, uh, it wasn't long ago when Chuck Wald had the job that you have right now, he talked about the significance of uh, phase zero. It, uh, he actually wrote an article about the, the phase zero campaign. Why is uh, phase zero important and how does it apply to AFRICOM? Could you make any comments about that? Senator, thank you. What, what I would say to that question is that the ability to engage with the population and have, have such exercises and engagements with uh, agencies that was, as was previously described, things like education, health care, jobs for the significant youth bulge that's in Africa is very, very important. We've got to get at these drivers that uh, make these uh, individuals, young men especially, want to join groups like Al-Shabaab. And in order to get that part of the problem, we need to be engaged with education, health care, jobs, and the like. And to preclude something from happening, uh, headed off of the past, and, and I, I would agree with that. Uh, we're also in Afghanistan, uh, General Votel. Um, and uh, we met with the, uh, our service members and, of course, the new president and John Nicholson. And I, uh, I think maybe we might be, in my opinion, because uh, I, and, and I might be influenced by the fact that I knew the new president's predecessor, and there's no comparison. Uh, it's summing up kind of what General Nicholson uh, said, I'll read this, These, uh, a need for a long-term co coalition commitment to Afghanistan, need for increased coalition forces for training and assisting the Afghan military, uh, the strength and the commitment of the Afghan people who want to take their country back from the insurgents, shifting the focus uh, to winning versus not losing. The high casualty rate among Afghan forces, the increase in territory controlled by the Taliban, the importance of cutting the Taliban's access to financing their operations. Uh, do you pretty much agree with his assessment with uh, what the situation is there? I do, I do, Senator. And do you think that uh, maybe when we get some of these less than optimistic reports uh, at this in these committee hearings that we have, that you get a little bit different idea when you're actually there? And one of the things that I think we're not factoring in enough would be the President Ghani. Uh, and I kind of get an I'd like to have your idea as to what 
uh, what a difference that can make. Because I, I can remember sitting there with, the, with his predecessor and then evaluating the situation, what his commitment is right now and what he, be, he really believes his people are going to be able to do. Senator, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you. I, I do think we uh, cannot over, over, overestimate the, the strategic advantage of having a, a leader like President Ghani in place, his willingness to partner, his uh, visionary ideas about this, and uh, his general approach to uh, bringing the coalition on board, I think, have been very, uh, very good, and I think they provide us a very good opportunity to build upon. Uh, all right. With, and with him and with your experience from the last fighting season that we had, since we're coming up now to the next fighting season, do you have any, any projection as to differences we might see uh, with that leadership in where we are right now? Uh, in, in, I, in I, I, think, uh, I think that we will continue to see very steady leadership from, uh, uh, from President Ghani and, and his government through, through the next fighting season. I think the challenge we will have will be sustaining the, uh, the Afghan forces as they move forward. They have, as you have noted, as others have noted, they have absorbed a lot of casualties, and yet they've been resilient through that. Mm -hmm. uh, but th there is a need to ensure that they get into a normal uh, operational cycle that allows them to recover, to, re to rebuild themselves, to reset themselves, and then get back into the fight. And I think that as we move forward, that will be the challenge that General Nicholson and I will have to manage. Yeah, and I, I, I would agree with that. And I think that the, there is a, an effect that the new president has on the fighting troops over there, on theirs, that will uh, yield a better performance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the fighting season has begun earlier than ever in Afghanistan. True, General? I, I, I think the fighting season does not end. I agree with you, Senator. Mm -hmm. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you to uh, both of you today for testifying. Appreciate uh, all that you do. You have a very difficult job, and both of you do it with honor. So thank you uh, so much uh, for your service to our country. I, uh, I represent uh, in Michigan uh, probably the largest Arab American Muslim American community here in the United States uh, and had an opportunity just recently to meet with a number of community members at the Islamic Center and heard uh, some uh, uh, great concern from the Yemeni American community as to uh, what they are seeing uh, in Yemen in terms of Saudi Arabian operations, um, uh, what seems to be indiscriminate bombing, uh, the killing of large numbers of civilians. I think, according to some estimates, uh, over close to 4,000 civilians uh, have been killed in Yemen by Saudi Arabian-led air campaign, uh, which uh, appears to them as indiscriminate. And uh, according to them, it uh, does great damage to, to the United States. Uh, people see those Saudi attacks as related to the United States and has been uh, uh, increasing uh, recruitment uh, for folks who want to do harm to the United States uh, because of the actions that are being undertaken by the Saudi Arabians. So if, uh, if you could uh, comment, uh, General Votel, a little bit about what is happening there uh, to us and what do you assess the cause of the large number of civilian casualties that we're seeing in Yemen and what can we do to reduce that? I, I attribute Thank you for the question, Senator. I attribute to those types of situations more to uh, the competence of, uh, of the forces that are operating there and their ability to properly target. Um, uh, as, as you are aware, we do not provide intelligence for those things. We do not make decisions for them. But yet we have a relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. And at my level and at levels below me, my air commander, a variety of civilian commanders, we have engaged with our leaders, uh, with our partner leaders in, in Saudi Arabia to talk to them about the effects of this and to provide uh, opportunities for them to learn from our experience in terms of this and improve their capabilities in this particular regard. I, and I think they have done that. In addition, I personally have uh, have uh, reached out and talked to my counterpart about the importance of reaching out to uh, international organizations like the ICRC. Doctors Without Borders, who also operate in these areas and, in sh and ask that they establish relationships and begin a discussion with uh, between the, the Saudi Arabian government and the Ministry of Defense and these particular organizations so we can better understand what's happening on the ground and we can begin to work through those. And I'm, and I'm very happy to tell you that that is, that is taking place now. So you, you would uh, characterize this as a training issue as opposed to... Uh uh, some other some other factor that's causing for it. I, I don't attribute it to deliberate de decisions to target civilians. I deliver. I attribute it to uh, a, a growing need to uh, develop a better and more precise targeting process uh, for their operations. 
And are we able to assist them in that? We, we don't, oper we don't uh, assist them directly with targeting on the ground, but we are able to, uh, through our uh, experience, through our people, uh, engage them and help with their professionalism and give them the benefit of our experience and tactics, techniques, procedures, processes that we use to try to absolutely minimize those types of events. And we are doing that. Well, it's good to hear. Thank you. General Votel, you uh, also to turn uh, to move to uh, Syria now. You were recently quoted in the New York Times uh, about saying that we want to bring the right capabilities forward, not all of those necessarily resident in the special operations community. If we need additional artillery or things like that, uh, I want to bring those forward uh, to augment our operations. And I uh, know today uh, uh, in the news there was an artillery unit that I believe is uh, being positioned uh, in Syria now. Uh, in your estimate, what is the right mix of conventional and special operations forces that are going to be required uh, to succeed in Syria? Uh, Senator, I'm not sure I can give you an exact percentage-wise mix of this, but uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that uh, it, the way that we operate today uh, uh, with our special operations forces and unique capabilities they bring, uh, through our experience of the last 15 or 16 years, we have become very uh, comfortable and capable of operating together. Uh, and so what, uh, what I have pledged to our commanders and what uh, I expect from them is for them to ask for the capabilities that we need and then for us to ensure that we have the right command and control, the right force protection, the right uh, resources in place to ensure that it can function uh, properly together. And that, is, uh, that to me is much more important than the, a particular mix of whatever the capabilities are. I think as we move more towards uh, the latter part of these operations, uh, uh, into more of the stability and other th aspects of the operations, we will see more conventional forces requirements, perhaps. Great. Thank you, General. Uh, let's get back to Afghanistan, General Votel. Um, do the Afghan people support the presence of the United States there? I, I believe that they. I believe that they do, Senator. And how do you measure that? I think we measure that by favorability ratings uh, that we see of them for the government of Afghanistan and the uh, and the activities that uh, uh, that they are pursuing. And I think we measure that through our uh, through our direct contact with them, with teams we have out there on the ground, and others that interact with uh, with the Afghan people on a regular basis. And uh, as a matter of fact, several years ago there was a lawyer Jurga con convened of most African, I mean most Afghan leaders and and they overwhelmingly were in support of the United States presence there to protect them against what had happened before. Ha, uh, has there been another Loya Jirga or, or do we simply assume that the leadership of uh, the elected leadership of the government represents them? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, there has not been another Loya Jirga I think of the same scope that you that you referenced, uh, uh, Senator, uh, but we do uh, pay attention to the the polling. I, I would note in some recent polls that I've seen, the favorability ratings for uh, for the Taliban are are very low in the six to seven percent range, as opposed to much much higher uh, for the government of Afghanistan. You had uh, strong praise for President Ghani. Um, how is the relationship uh, there between uh, the president and Mr. Abdullah, who was his? nearest competitor. It has uh, improved significantly, and I contribute that uh, directly to the engagement of our ambassadors on the ground who have been personally invested in that and worked that relationship, uh, and it has had a positive impact on our operations. Well, that's good to hear. Now, uh, the information we have, and the chairman alluded to this, um, the, the Afghan government controls 57 percent of the country's districts. Uh, a year and a half ago, that figure was 72 percent. What happened? I, I, think, I think the numbers, and, and, uh, and Senator, I, w I would tell you that there are other numbers out there. We, we have some slightly different ones, but they're in the general ballpark of what you're, what you're saying. Generally, those numbers are correct. In, in general. There, the, so there's been a significant drop, as the chairman said, in a year and a half. There has been uh, there have been areas uh, that uh, that are in what we would put into the contested uh, space area here that uh, that have increased uh, over 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 the last year. So and certainly, the, your testimony would be that this hasn't happened because the support among the African people of our efforts has diminished. 
No, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think this is uh, something this is we a, did. I think this is effect of the of the of the of the fighting that is taking place and of the efforts by the Taliban to be more resurgent in specific areas in Afghanistan. Well, okay. Senator, uh, General Nicholson said um, in talking about the stalemate that what will break the stalemate are um, offensive capabilities such as special forces and uh, allowing the Air Force to overmatch the Taliban. Um, also, um, he said, we have, a, we have a shortfall of a few thousand troops in Afghan for the train, advise, and assist mission. Would you talk about those two aspects, and would you support a few thousand more American troops to get the job done in this mission? Senator, with respect to the last part of your question, that's, uh, that's certainly a discussion we're having with the Secretary right now. I, I won't uh, pre, pre, pre uh, stage a, a decision here on him. That's certainly his regard, but uh, certainly I, 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 I agree with what, uh, with what uh, General Nicholson's approach is. And I do agree that uh, uh, you know, one of our efforts to uh, improve the capabilities and equipment of the Afghan Air Force is a big part of this, as is uh, improving and expanding their special operations capability. Thank you. General Waldhauser, um, the WASP uh, amphibious uh, expedition did over, over 100 consecutive days of strikes. It's considered to be uh, an impressive success. What lessons have we learned from that deployment, and are we sending you what you need to get the job done in that respect? The WASP and Marine Aviation that was on board that ship was a significant contributor to the GNA forces and ridding CERTA of vices. Um, lessons learned at the tactical level have to do with coordination on the ground and special forces oper and special forces who are there on the ground. But I think it's important to point out that there, over that from one August to the middle of December, there were nearly 500 strikes. Most of them came from ISR uh, platforms, but a lot of them, as you said, came from the ship. And I think the ability of zero civilian casualties uh, in a very, very dense urban environment underscores the training and the professionalism of those who are conducting that operation. So in sum, uh, that was a huge asset for us. We actually borrowed it from CENTCOM in order to make it happen. But that's how we have to do business these days. We, we, there's AFRICOM and CENTCOM coordinate on various trans-regional asset changes, and that was an example where it worked very well. Thank you, sir. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and General Votel and General Waldhauser. Thank you both for your testimony and for your service. General Votel, there's already been reference to the Marines who have arrived in Syria. Um, the Washington Post story this morning reports that um, the battalion landing team, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, will man the guns and deliver fire support for U.S.-backed local forces who are preparing an assault on the city. First of all, is that accurate, and does, should we take that to mean an assault is imminent in Raqqa? Well, certainly I, we won't talk about any of uh, timings of any of our particular operations, but our intention here with this and this fell within the authorities that are, that are provided to me right now was to ensure that we had redundant capable fire support on the ground to support our partners and ensure that we, had, we could take advantage of opportunities and ensure uh, continued, con the continued progress that we've been seeing. And are you comfortable that that gives us that? progress and support that we in, con need. in conjunction with our uh, with our excellent coalition air forces yes I, I, I am very confident that that will help us thank you um, yesterday in our meeting and we heard similar comments from general Nichols Nicholson when he was here talking about Russian influence in Afghanistan they're trying to legitimize the Taliban and undermine our mission and NATO's mission there can you talk about what alternatives we have to respond to Russian activities there? Well, I think the I think the the best alternative that we have is to ensure that we demonstrate our commitment to the mission that we have in place here with uh, with the government of Afghanistan. Uh, certainly, with our you know our two twofold mission focused on counterterrorism, and then of course the train, advise, and assist mission. So the most important thing we can do is send a very clear message that we are going to uh, see this mission through and support. The, the government of Afghanistan in the way that they require it with military capabilities and other things to ensure that they can be successful. 
And to what is it, extent does our um, effort in Eastern Europe with NATO affect Russia's ability to um, undermine what we're doing in Afghanistan? How much are they, do they need to be focused on um, what's happening in Eastern Europe? Um, from my perspective, I'd like them totally focused on Eastern Europe and not on Afghanistan, if we could. Uh, I'm being a little facetious here, but right. I uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I can comment that there's necessarily a direct relationship between that between that senator uh, certainly i think that uh, uh uh you know if they if their attention can be drawn to other other challenges other problems that they are focused on uh that that helps us Thank you. general waldhauser in your statement you point out that long-term success in slowing the progress of boko haram and isis in west africa requires nigeria to address development governance and economic deficiencies, which are drivers of terrorism in that region. Um, as we look at the future where one in four Africans are Nigerian, um, what happens in Nigeria has a huge impact on what happens throughout the, West, the rest of Africa. Is that, do you agree with that? I most definitely do. With 182 million people in that country, it's the seventh largest country in the world. What happens there has a significant impact, not only on the continent, but it could be in Europe and the United States as well. And to what extent do we feel like they are addressing the threat from Boko Haram and also addressing those deficiencies that have existed there? Sir, two weeks ago, I was in Abuja and talked with the acting vice president. And he's very, very aware of the fact that there's still much work that needs to be done in northeastern Nigeria, both with Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa. And I came away from that uh, visit uh, in a positive way because there have been some human rights issues with the Nigerians, right. but they, they are taking that on. I mean, they're making some progress there. But I think the, the acting vice president, the acting president understands there's still a threat. Boko Haram has weakened a bit, but there's still a threat. ISIS West, Af West Africa is still there and they are still a threat. But this Lake Chad Basin Region Task Force has been doing fairly well with at least trying to keep the problem inside the Nigerian borders. And are they working to address the historic divisions between the Christian southern part of the country and the Muslim north? Are, are there any initiatives underway that help to resolve some of those historic conflicts? Senator, I'm not aware of any per se. I would just say that uh, in my discussions with senior leadership there two weeks ago, they have a fairly um, wide-ranging and overarching strategy of where they want to go, which ultimately will turn over northeastern Nigeria to the police forces. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Votel, since the nuclear deal with Iran was announced, Iran's behavior in the region, its support for terrorism, and its domestic repression, it appears to have gotten worse. Iran wields significant power in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen, and it seeks to destabilize our key allies. What do you see as Iran's goal in the region? Senator, I believe uh, Iran seeks to be the regional hegemon, to be the uh, the most influential country in the region. And how would you characterize Iran's regional behavior since the nuclear agreement? Has it improved or has it worsened? I would describe it as destabilizing to the region. It has not been helpful to anything that I can see uh, going on across the region. How would you characterize Iran's relationship with Russia in the region? Um, again, not having first-hand knowledge on that, I, I guess I would characterize it as they, uh, they, are, they find areas of cooperation. Um, I, I, am, I am particularly concerned how both Iran and Russia have uh, cooperated to prop up the Assad regime uh, and make them stronger. That is certainly of some concern. Uh, uh, so I, I do see that level of cooperation being very unhelpful to the things that we are doing across the, uh, the region. I don't know what the long-term views of each of these countries might be and how that might play out, but it certainly looks like they are taking the opportunity to, of convenience to, uh, to join, join efforts in, in some regard. And I wanted to ask you uh, your long-term view uh, with regards to the United States and our uh, position in the region. Um, first of all, just with um, Iran's destabilizing activities, but also with their relationship with Russia. Can you 
Can you give us, in your best opinion, um, how that affects the United States and our involvement? I can't, I can, Senator, and I'll offer you my observation. It's based on my travels throughout the region over the last year and meeting with our partners uh, uh, across many of the countries. And I, my, my consistent takeaway here is that uh, the, the, the partners in the region would, would strongly prefer to have a relationship with the United States over, over any other nation that might, uh, might be external to the Middle East. And I think that is an opportunity for us uh, to move forward on. We have long-term historical relationships with many of these countries, uh, and we should capitalize on that as we move forward. And I think that offers us the best opportunity. As we uh, look over the last year, we've seen Iran has escalated its harassment of our vessels, our personnel in the Persian Gulf. And just last week, uh, multiple fast attack vessels from the IR GC came close to a U.S. Navy ship in the Strait of Hormuz, and they forced it to change direction. What is CENCOM doing to um, address that harassment that we're seeing by Iran? Well, first, uh, first off, we are ensuring that our maritime forces have all the right rules of engagement and, uh, and capabilities and training and techniques to, to deal with that. And I do believe they are effectively doing that. One of the first things I did after coming into command was get on a ship and go through the Straits of Hormuz so I could see it with my own eyes. And I was extraordinarily impressed with the uh, maturity of our sailors and the judgment of our leaders as we, as we went through that. More, uh, more broadly, I think we have to hold Iran accountable for their actions. No other nation operates the way they do in the Arabian Gulf. Nobody does that uh, in, in the Arabian Gulf. And they, they need to be held accountable for that, and they need to be exposed for those types of uh, unprofessional, unsafe, and abnormal uh, activities. It sounds like uh, you are very concerned with Iran's growing asymmetrical capabilities, and that includes its acquisition of advanced cruise missiles, I would assume? It does, Senator. Uh, what about naval mines, ballistic missiles, and UAVs? And how do those threats, um, I guess, when we're looking at, at our interests in the Persian Gulf and our allies' interests in the Persian Gulf, uh, how, do, how do those growing threats affect that? Well, the way they affect us is they provide Iran with a layered capability uh, where they can use uh, their they're fast boats, they can use cruise missiles, they can use radars, they can use UAVs uh, to uh, potentially dominate specific areas. So uh, this, is, this is a concern, and it is something that certainly we look at in our capabilities, and it's something that we have engaged our partners in the region on, on how we work together to, uh, to mitigate the, the effects of that layered uh, approach that uh, Iran pursues in these critical choke points. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to return to an issue raised by Senator Reid. There's a big debate going on right now, as you know, about military spending, and of course we need a strong military, but the military is not the only element of our national security strategy. Spending on security outside the military budget is very small. Diplomacy and development combined is about 1% of our annual budget. But it includes programs that promote democracy, human rights, the rule of law, that boost economic growth, that improve access to education, that fight hunger, that treat infectious diseases, and that provide disaster relief around the world. General Votel and General Walheimer uh, Hauser, you command our armed forces in some of the most active and dangerous parts of the world. Do you think the activities of the State Department and other civilian partners are a waste of time and taxpayer money? I do not, Senator. Thank you. Senator, nor do I. They're a big part of what we do. Thank you. And I agree. But the Trump administration's blueprint budget would increase defense spending in some areas by massively slashing through other programs that are critical for our national security. You know, not every international problem is the same, and the right tool is not always a military response. Kneecapping our State Department by cutting an already small foreign aid budget makes America less safe, and that's just not smart. 
I'd like to turn to another issue, and that's the ongoing fight against ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. General Votel, you contributed to the Pentagon's plan to accelerate the fight against ISIS, which Secretary Mattis delivered to the White House last week. I have every confidence that the U.S. military can defeat ISIS on the battlefield and help retake strategically important cities. But what I want to ask you is about what comes next. You're going to be mediating between armed opposition forces that dislike each other intensely in cities where existing infrastructure has been completely destroyed with a population that has been traumatized and displaced. What will it take to create conditions for normal life to resume in Mosul and Raqqa? Well, I, I think it starts uh, certainly following up our military operations with good local governance and getting uh, addressing humanitarian aid, uh, of uh, addressing issues like demining, of restoring basic services to the people, of uh, trying to bring additional aid in there so small businesses and other things can get going, and then the bigger aspects of, uh, of governance can begin to take place. And so as we look at our military operations, particularly as we look at places like Raqqa or Mosul, what we have tried to do is ensure that our military planning is very closely linked to the political planning that has to, what comes next so that we don't just finish a military operation and then just leave. It is important that we have local hold forces. It is important that we predetermine the local governance that's going to come in and begin to take this over. So I think that's an extraordinarily important point in the transition from military operations to uh, the stability operations and things that, that come next, I think is, an, is, a, is a significant lesson learned for us relearned for us many times, and it is something that we have specifically focused on in this campaign. Thank you. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, General. You know, planning for peace is hard. We didn't do it after we toppled Saddam Hussein, and we are still paying a price for that blindness today. And I don't want to see us turn around and make that same mistake again. I think we need to be very careful that we don't create an environment that breeds the next generation of extremists. And I am grateful for your work in this area. I'm grateful to both of you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator Cotton. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, welcome back to the committee. Uh, General Waldhauser, uh, you were speaking with Senator Shaheen about Nigeria and the role that it plays, not just in the African continent, but around the world. Could you speak a little bit about what uh, President Buhari's absence from the country um, means and, and what the status is right now of Nigerian politics for the committee? Senator, I would just have to say that open source reporting indicates that he's still in, in London receiving medical help. That was a topic that was not discussed with the officials when I was there. But what I did uh, observe was uh, Acting President Oban Jo has done extremely well. He's very competent. He has a very, I would say, very um, wide view of the problems and issues, and he seems to want to get after them. And he was definitely genuinely interested in, in making things happen, and I thought we had some very frank discussions with him on the way ahead with regards to our support for, you know, the defeat of ISIL, ISIL West Africa and Boko Haram. Okay. What, what's the level of political consensus and stability between the North and the South in that country right now? I really couldn't give you a fair assessment of that. That wasn't, it wasn't part of the discussion. I didn't. We didn't have that topic. I understand. Looking to the east, uh, would you please discuss the strategic implications of China's new base in Djibouti and what it means for our presence there and throughout the Horn of Africa? So the Chinese base is right outside Camp Lemonye, about four miles or so from our base. Uh, the intention for that uh, location was to provide a port for their ships they have in the area. Uh, they, do, they have about 2,200 peacekeepers on the continent. This is the first time for them that they've uh, kind of journeyed in that direction. Uh, the con so right now, uh, it's a, due to be completed later this summer. I would just say the concern that I have from an operational perspective is the operational security when we operate so close to uh, a Chinese base. And the Camp Lemonade Djibouti area is not only AFRICOM, but CENTCOM uses it, SOCOM uses it, TRANSCOM, UCOM, and the like. So it's a very strategic location. And visiting Djiboutian officials twice, I've talked with their president and uh, expressed our concerns about uh, some of the things that we that are important to us about what the Chinese can or should not or, or cannot do at that location. Thank you. 
General Votel, uh, you've already spoken with several senators this morning about the stalemate in Afghanistan. Uh, for many years now, we on this committee and many leaders in the executive branch have been lamenting the existence of sanctuaries for the Taliban and other terrorist group in, in Pakistan. As you think about the strategy to break this stalemate, uh, what's the role of eliminating those sanctuaries uh, inside of Pakistan, and how do how, how do you plan to get after this long-standing problem? Thank you, Senator. Pa Pakistan, of course, remain, is, remains a, a key partner in uh, in this in this fight here. I, I've, I've been encouraged by my meetings with uh, the new Chief of Army Staff, General Bajwa, and his commitment to uh, to help address this. They have done some things that have been helpful to us. Most recently, they've uh, they've uh, they've uh, supported General Nicholson in some operations along the border, making sure that they were well coordinated and doing activities on their side of the border. That's a very positive sign and a move in the right direction. And they have done things against uh, the principal concerns that we have, the Haqqani network and Taliban. Uh, but what we do need is we need we need that to be more uh, more persistent and, uh, and and continue to focus in that particular area, and so we will continue to engage uh, with partner uh, with uh, Pakistan throughout this. I think it is key to ensure that Pakistan and Afghanistan have a very good relationship. Uh, there are certainly are tensions along the along the common border between those countries, and so I think a key role that we can play is in helping move that relationship forward. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, about a seam uh, on the map between you and Harry Harris, but it's an important seam uh, because it involves Pakistan and Afghanistan and India in PACOM. To what extent do you think Pakistan's Afghan policy is driven in part uh, by its India policy, uh, and in particular, whether or not a, a independent Afghanistan conducting its own foreign policy might be adverse to Pakistani interests? I, Senator, I think uh, Pakistan's view of the region, I think as they look at their interests, I think they, they, it, it plays very largely in how they look at both sides of, of their country. Okay. Uh, one final question. Since the 1970s, Russia's influence throughout the Middle East uh, has been minimal, thanks in large part to the diplomacy of Henry Kissinger and Presidents Nixon and Ford. Uh, how would you assess uh, the level of Russia's influence in the region today? Russia is uh, is attempting to increase their influence throughout the Middle East, as we've seen in in Syria. We've seen them do things, and uh, uh, certainly with uh, with our longstanding partner Egypt and and others uh, across the across the region. So I, it is my view that they are trying to increase their influence in this critical part of the do, globe. Do you think they've been successful in any of those attempts thus far? Well, they certainly have been successful in supporting the Assad regime, and so uh, that's that's certainly an example of that. And uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to uh, reassert our own relationships as well. Thank you, gentlemen. On behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator King. Uh, thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, General Votel, let's talk about four areas where we're engaged in conflict, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. By the way, I want to compliment you on your written statement. It is a primer on the region that I think should be required reading for everyone in this body. It's very well done, very thoughtful, and, and uh, comprehensive. Uh, who are our allies in Iraq? Who are we fighting next to? The ISF, right? That's correct, Senator. Uh, and the Kurds? The, the Peshmerga, the, Peshmerga. The, in, in the northern part of, and, uh, of Iraq. And what certainly. religion are the members of the ISF and the Kurds? They are, uh, they are, uh, they are Muslims. Uh, and, uh, and, and in Syria, we've got the Syrian Democratic Forces and also the Kurds? That's, that we have Syrian Kurds, and we are working with, uh, with local Syrian Arabs, Turkmen, and in some cases, uh, local Christian uh, forces. But the vast majority of those forces are Muslim, is that correct? That is correct. And in Yemen, UAE, Saudi Arabia, those forces are Muslim? Absolutely. And in Afghanistan, the ANSF, the uh, uh, Afghan National Security Forces, also Muslim? They are Muslim. And your, one of the statements you've made in your opening uh, comments were, we, there, our strategy rests upon, quote, a heavy reliance on indigenous forces. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. And it's fair to say that the vast majority of those indigenous forces are Muslim. That, that is the case today. So it would be a mistake as a matter of national policy, rhetoric, or 
uh, discussion if we uh, attempted to alienate or marginalize, marginalize Muslim citizens of anywhere in the world because these are our allies in all of the fights that we're engaged in in your area. Isn't that correct? I believe it is, uh, it is correct, Senator. And uh, you talked about restoring trust with our partners in the region. Our partners in the region are all based upon uh, Muslim societies. Isn't that correct? They, they largely are. This is largely a Muslim, Muslim area. The second area, and this has been discussed to some extent, but again, it's in your report on page three and five of your, uh, of your statement. Uh, the, the goals that you define cannot be accomplished solely through military means, you say. The military can help create the necessary conditions. There must be concomitant progress in other complementary areas, reconstruction, humanitarian aid, stabilization, political reconciliation. On page five, you say, however, a solely military response is not sufficient. Uh, we must, this must be accomplished through a combination of capabilities if we're going to achieve and sustain our democratic, our deterrence posture, our strongest deterrence posture. Again, just to put a fine point on what has been discussed previously, to solely rely on military strength in solving these very complex and difficult problems would be a serious mistake. Would you agree? I, I would agree, uh, Senator. I, I think we have to have a combination of all of our elements of power, hard power and soft power. Thank you. Um, Next question, uh, this is a, a slightly different subject. Uh, how, in, in your work with a lot of these allies, you work with these countries, with Iraq uh, and, and uh, other countries in the region, how would it be received in the Arab world if the United States relocates its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem without a settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? I, I think that uh, from my personal discussions uh, with some in the, in the region, I think that it would, it would create some challenges for, for some of those countries. Some challenges? Can you it would, expand? It would certainly Serious be, challenges? Yeah, I, it could potentially be I, very serious. And that, does that include our uh, staunch ally, Jordan? I believe, it, yes, sir, it, it does, Senator. Thank you. Uh, final question to, to both of you. Uh, Foreign military sales and foreign military financing programs, are they appropriately calibrated to meet your needs in the region? My sense is that that is an area where uh, we, could, we could use some work. From my perspective, Senator, uh, the, the importance of the foreign military sales and foreign military funding programs is to help build capability for our partners that's interoperable with us. Uh, they generally want to buy U.S. equipment because it comes along with training, it comes along with sustainment, and it makes them more interoperable with them. I, I think we have to take a long-term view uh, in terms of this, and uh, I think it is in our interest for our partners in the region to uh, Use, uh, use capabilities that are interoperable with ours. General Walthouser, in just a few seconds I have left, a quick update on the status of ISIS in Libya. Status in ISIS in Libya is they right now are regrouping. They're in small numbers, small groups. We try to develop the intelligence. But after they left CERT, we developed intelligence. We bombed them on January 18th, and they were in the southern part of, the, of, of Libya. They've scattered again now. They're in small groups try, trying to regroup. No longer control CERT. Correct. No longer control, sir. They were out of cert in the middle of December. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By the way, General Wotel, just to complicate things further, Barzani, the leader of the Iraqi Kurds, does not support the KRG, the Syrian Kurds, right? Uh, that is correct, Chairman. Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today and your time and attention uh, to all of our questions. Uh, General Votel, uh, we had an interesting conversation the other day, and as the chair of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, you mentioned something to me that I thought was very interesting and something that I am concerned about, and that's the increasing threat that's posed by ISIS's ability to use drones. Um, we had a, a great uh, conversation about that, and what they're using, you say, was kind of a modified commercial off-the-shelf drone. And can you tell us about that emerging threat and maybe describe for, for those on the committee exactly what they're using and what those capabilities are? Oops. Thank you, Senator. Uh, what, what we're seeing, I think, are commercially acquired uh, drones are generally quadcopters that are available, I think, uh, 
very very easily by anybody on online or at other places, uh, hobby hobby hobbyist uh, locations, uh, and uh, what they're able to do is obviously operate them for uh, purposes of their own surveillance. And uh, as as you as we've seen in the news, there's in some cases they've uh, they've been able to rig um, grenades and other things to them, and so that uh, uh, they have been able to achieve some some effects with that. Um, so. It's concerning to our partners. It's certainly concerning to us, and it's, I think it's a uh, it's a, uh, a reminder of just how savvy and, and challenging of an enemy that we are dealing with here. And uh, I think it requires us to make sure that we are equally uh, savvy in our approach to this, and we have making sure we have the right tools to defend against these types of. Uh, these types of threats. Absolutely, thank you. It, it reminds me of the early part of the Iraq War when um, the forces there were using uh, remote control cars with explosives uh, as a first form of IEDs. And, and of course, through the years, they grew technologically advanced. And so I see something so simple as this uh, that could become much more complicated over time. Do the Iraqi forces have the capabilities to defeat those drones? We are working on providing them the capabilities. Right now, they, they, they enjoy protection against these threats in a number of areas, largely because we have, the, we have capabilities with our forces that are accompanying them and are located in, those, in their locations. Very good. Thank you. And we also spoke about troop numbers yesterday and, and how random some of those numbers tend to be when you have that artificial boundary of a country line uh, between Iraq and Syria. And if you could please share with the committee um, what is our role in, in that? Should that role be of troop numbers and where those troops are located be left up to our on-the-ground combatant commanders? If you could just uh, share a little bit of that conversation. Well, Senator, I, I think uh, the, the more we can provide agility for our commanders on the ground to make decisions about where they need forces and when they need it, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the most appropriate thing that, that can be done. I, I think we are most successful when we enable our very good and well-qualified leaders Leaders and people on the ground to make decisions in the situations in which they see it. So I, I am for making sure that we try to provide them the agility in the, in the process or around that. We certainly understand why it's important to look at things like numbers and stuff like that. It certainly drives our resources and budgeting and other aspects of that. So that certainly has to be taken into consideration. But I, I, uh, I look at this more from a flexibility and agility standpoint for our commanders on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And General Waldhauser, um, thank you as well. As you know, Tunisia has sent more foreign fighters than any other country to join the ranks of ISIS abroad. And in addition to supplying the foreign fighters, Tunisia struggles with containing uh, the terrorist activity on their own soil and so much that they've, they've had a physical wall built um, along the border with Libya in attempt to deter terrorists from entering their country. Uh, is AFRICOM currently equipped to address the potential influx of ISIS fighters returning home to Tunisia as we strike them elsewhere, whether it's in the Middle East or other places? Senator, I'd have to uh, characterize uh, Tunisia as one of the bright spots on the continent. Mm -hmm. They are in the process of transforming their military to be more uh, capable of dealing with terrorist threats. They have purchased equipment from the United States, which we are helping them with right now, helicopters and the like. We have people on the ground who are training, advising, and assisting their special operations forces. And I believe the wall that you refer to is a technical, uh, technical equipment provided by DITRA as well as Germany to help them contain the, fighter, the foreign fighter flow back and forth between especially Libya and Tunisia. But the bottom line is they're a bright spot. I've visited them twice, and they're, in the right, they're headed in the right direction. They are struggling with what to do with foreign fighters who return. But again, I think that's, uh, that's, that's not a negative uh, against them. Very good. Well, I appreciate it. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your input. Thank you. On behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank both of you for your service. And uh, as you did in your testimony, General Hotel, uh, the outstanding men and women under both your commands who make us proud and who are doing such great work under your command. Uh, I want to join uh, Senator King in thanking you for your testimony, which is a very, very enlightening 
for me, elucidating outline of the challenges. And I would note for my colleagues, particularly in your description of the next generation of cyber warriors or the use of cyber warfare by our adversaries, going from the rather rudimentary weapons of the roadside bombs to the much more sophisticated use of cyber and, as my colleague has pointed out, drones and other challenges that face us there. I want to focus on Iran. In response to uh, Senator Fisher's question about whether Iranian aggression has increased since the nuclear treaty, you pointed out that their conduct there has been destabilizing. The word you used was destabilizing and abnormal. Uh, and of course, we know uh, Iran has tested an anti-ship ballistic missile there, uh, a new Russian-made S-300 missile air defense system, as well as harassing a Navy ship, uh, the USS Invincible, in the Strait of Hormuz by sending an Iranian frigate within, I think, 150 yards, smaller boats within 600 yards. Last month, the Iranians fired a medium-range ballistic missile in violation of the U.S. Security Council resolution, resulting in United States sanctions enforcement against 25 individuals and entities. That action was in violation of the U.N. resolution, but none of these other activities are in violation of the nuclear agreement, are they? The, the, my understanding, Senator, is the nuclear agreement did not address any of those other aspects of the Iranian threat. But would you agree with me that they do demand a response from the United States? I would absolutely agree, Senator. And, and much more aggressive, not only sanctions, but warnings and actions against their partners in this effort, most prominently the Russians. I, I would agree. I, I think we should uh, use a combination of both diplomatic and other security-related tools here, uh, economic tools, to, to address this concern. Would, would you agree with me that the Russians, through the Iranians, in effect, are testing us in that area because they are, in effect, aiding and abetting the Iranians in this increasing destabilizing activity? Well, I would, uh, I would, I would, I, w I would, Senator, and I would, uh, I, I would certainly uh, point to a place like, uh, like uh, Syria, where these two countries have essentially propped up a, a regime here and made them more capable, more powerful, uh, and uh, kept them from collapsing. So, but when we complain about the Iranians, and uh, all of us probably in this room would agree with you that they are the major destabilizing influence in that area, we're talking as much about the Russians as we are about the Iranians. Senator, I've, in my comments here, I was specifically talking about the, about the Iranian threat. That is the one that, uh, that we confront with, certainly, as I mentioned also in my opening statement here. We are concerned about external actors and what their interests are in, 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 uh, in the region as well, and uh, those can contribute to more destabilizing aspects as well. So um, I, I think they have to be addressed uh, they both have to be addressed. And how would you suggest that we should address the Iranian destabilizing influence of this regime? regime? I, I think there are a variety of things. I think the most important thing is to is to work with our uh, regional partners here to ensure that we have a common common approach to this. I think in some cases we should uh, look at uh, ways that we can uh, disrupt their activities uh, through a variety of means, not just military means. Uh, we have to expose them for the things they're doing. They, have to, they should be held accountable for those things. Uh, and I think we have to contest their revolutionary ideology. Uh, and it's not just the United States, but it has to be uh, those in the region. Iran has a role in the region. They have been around for a long period of time. Nobody is trying to make Iran go away, but we are concerned about the destabilizing behavior that they pursue on a regular basis. Uh, my time has expired, but this topic is one that I think is, is profoundly important. I will have some more questions that I hope you and your staff perhaps can answer and uh, maybe in a a different setting as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. On behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator Perdue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here before you two gentlemen. Thank you for your um, great careers and what you're doing for our country today. And I, I hope you'll take this message back to your troops that uh, everything they do over there uh, is not missed on us. I, I have a question about ISIS. I'd like to talk about uh, General Votel. First of all, I think uh, one of the first things that uh, the President has done is asked for a 30-day review of the current strategy and so forth. Um, where are we in that process? And, and um, what types of things can we expect to see in terms of uh, um, our strategy there? And I'd like you also to address what is our end game? And uh, can you talk about that today, or should we wait until we see the 30-day uh, review? I, I, Senator, I think it's most appropriate for the, for the Secretary, who, is, who I believe has presented his, his findings to the, to the new administration. And I think he is probably the person who is most appropriate to talk about, uh, talk about uh, the decisions and end states that will come out of that. Okay, fair enough. Um, with regard to ISIS in the Sinai, uh, right now, Egypt, uh, there are daily uh, efforts there, I think. Can you give us an update on what uh, is being done and, and what other countries are involved in uh, the fight with ISIS? And, and give us a, an order of magnitude of the size of that uh, action in the Sinai. Uh, the, uh, the Egyptians have, uh, have deployed, uh, several months ago, have deployed forces uh, into the Sinai and specifically around uh, uh, around uh, the, the area where the multinational force is. That has been helpful. That has helped address a, a threat that was emerging there. Uh, and they have been, uh, they have been engaged, they are engaged on a regular basis in, in, uh, in fighting uh, ISIS in that particular area. Um, uh, Egypt uh, is, uh, is addressing this. Uh, uh, they, we are helping them in, in some areas, particularly with, uh, uh, with some of our expertise in, uh, in uh, expl uh, improvised explosive devices. They have asked for that, and so we've been uh, key to help them uh, with that uh, in, in this particular area. Do we have any troops on the ground in ISIS or in uh, Sinai? We, we do not have any troops on the ground that are fighting ISIS. We do have troops on the ground in the Sinai that are associated with the multinational force mission. Thank you. Uh, General Waldhauser, I, I want to go back to a question that was earlier um, um, asked of you about uh, China's presence in, in uh, Africa, uh, and particularly the, the base at Djibouti. Given what Russia has done with Crimea and now at Latakia and at Tortuz, are you concerned that, uh, that we'll see other activity of base building in Africa? That, uh, have you heard, had any other uh, indications of either Russia or China developing permanent uh, positions of presence in that, uh, in that theater? Senator, in 2013, the Chinese laid out a strategic plan of one belt, one road, where they'll have commerce that starts in China, goes down through the, uh, to uh, Indonesia, Malacca, Straits Malacca, across over to, to Djibouti, up into Europe and back. And that's roughly 60 countries and 40 percent of the global GDP that goes on in that area. It's all about trade. Um, this is their first endeavor in an overseas base, and it won't be their last. Thank you, sir. I want to ask one more question real quick. I'm, I'm about out of time. But in Somalia and, and uh, Sudan, there's a, um, a, gr a growing threat that there's a real serious famine that's about to, to happen if it hadn't already started there. What, what will that do to the military situation in that, uh, in that area? Well, first of all, Somalia, Senator, this right now is the most pressing issue to the brand new president who was just elected this last month. Right now, there's over 6.2 million individuals who have been affected by it, and it hasn't been, to my knowledge, actually declared a famine yet. But in terms of combating Al Shabaab and the like, movement of people in those large masses has an impact on military operations. But the bottom line in Somalia is right now, uh, and we're, we're, we have counterterrorism operations. We're trying to build up the national security forces. But that uh, famine for the brand new president and, and this fledgling national government is the biggest thing on their plate. They have to do well in this because if they can't provide for this famine, then Somalia, who has been without a national government for over 20 years, is going to question what the purpose and, and what contributions they will make. Thank you, sir. One last real quick question. Uh, in Maron, Spain, I was fortunate enough to, to, to meet uh, and visit with some of your great uh, Marines there. And they've got a, a very uh, strong mission. Unfortunately, um, late last year, they had to move about half of their uh, air uh, assets back to the U.S. for training. Can you talk about readiness with regard to their mission in Africa? Senator, the impact right now is, is really capacity for us. So we've had to kind of center their activity mostly on Western Africa. And so some of the missions we have in Eastern Africa that they would be able to, to deploy to in the past, 
we'd have to coordinate with CENTCOM, and we've actually used Marines from the Oregon MU in CENTCOM on the ground in Djibouti to take care of crisis response activities, specifically South Sudan, that we had at that time. So the readiness of the airplanes has gotten better, but when you go from 12 to 6, the capacity is cut in half, and the impact is we've got to do a better job coordinating and sharing assets because the Africa continent is extremely large. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for your service. We are, we are so grateful for your hard work. Um, General Votel, as, um, as we move forward in Mosul and uh, some of the ISIS fighters uh, head out, um, what, what efforts do we have in place to try to capture them before they head to Raqqa or to other areas, or where are they, um, where are they heading out to? Well, Senator, thank you for the question. I, you know, our, our intention, of course, is to prevent them from getting out. And so the first part of all of our operations is to isolate the areas uh, where we are, where our attacks are taking place by our partners and where we're bringing our enabling capabilities so that we don't let anybody get out or get in. Um, <clears throat> Being a desert, this is obviously a very porous area, so there, there probably are some to get out. I think they are generally moving into the middle of the Euphrates River Valley, um, which is, uh, you know, a location that is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, equidistant between uh, Mosul and Raqqa. Um, a while ago, we were in, um, we were just outside Haditha in Anbar province, um, meeting with the, the Iraqi leaders there. And I just wanted to follow up to, uh, at that time, they were uh, close to starvation for a lot of their citizens. It was extremely difficult um, uh, for all of their families. Where are we now in terms of solidifying Haditha, uh, Fallujah, Ramadi, those areas? And are they, are they working with us and with the central government? Uh, Senator, they are, and uh, we are making progress with the humanitarian aid and the, and the needs of the people out in, out in all of those areas. And uh, this, I think, is, a, is an area that we have to pay particular attention to as we move forward into, particularly in the large German areas, is that our military operations have to, uh, planning for those has to be done in conjunction with the uh, humanitarian aid planning and, uh, and, and, and providing for the needs of the people that will be left behind. So I think this is a key aspect for us. As we head toward Raqqa, um, we've seen that, that um, Marines have come in. Are you getting everything that you need in terms of uh, equipment, uh, manpower, all of those things to, um, to take Raqqa back? We, we are, Senator, and I'm uh, certainly in discussions with the Secretary about what we might need going forward. Because uh, I, I think our feeling is um, we don't want to not get this done as soon as possible because we didn't. We didn't um, provide you with the necessary equipment, necessary personnel. Um, as we look at Raqqa and moving forward, obviously there's a lot of complication with the Turks and with others. Um, how are all those pieces coming together for you? Well, it is, as you know, Senator, this is an extraordinarily complex, uh, complex area here, and so we're trying to work with a with an indigenous force uh, that has uh, that has tensions with a NATO ally, uh, and so. That's not, a, that's not an easy situation to move through, uh, but, I, but I think the way we are addressing it is, uh, is, is, is in the right way. We are being as transparent as we can. We are providing information. We are looking for options uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure we can mitig mitigate and minimize uh, the tension that, uh, that exists in this area. Um, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't try to tell you that there's an easy way through all this complexity. There's not. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take military work. It's going to take diplomatic work uh, as we move forward. And I, I'm, I, I, I do believe that is the approach that uh, we're taking. And I think that ultimately it, it, it will help. It will work for us. I was, I was going to follow up. You were kind enough to come by my office to, to follow up and say, I, I think your idea of complete transparency, here's what we're doing, here's what we're working on, here's how we plan to do it. And uh, to try to cooperate as much as we can with other countries, but to tell them this is, this is the plan and this is where we're going um, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, as you look at um, what has gone on in the Arabian Gulf, we just saw another incident with our ships recently. And um, as, as uh, we move forward, it, the distances seem to be less. They get closer, they get closer. Um, do we have a plan ready to go where at some point we say, you know, you've crossed the red line, and if they continue, that we take appropriate action. 
uh, Senator, I, I am very confident in our ship captains and in our crews uh, for them to deal with the situation. I do believe they have the right uh, rules of engagement. They have the right tools to uh, prevent things. And then in the case that they uh, prevention does not uh, work or deterrence does not work, then they have the capabilities um, to, to defend themselves and take action. So I, I am very confident in our people. My guess is, is that there will become an X crosses Y point, and I just want to make sure that our captains and all of them are ready, and, and I have the same confidence. General Waldhauser, as you, um, um, as you look at your, your area of command, um, what do you see as our biggest challenge right now that, that you are dealing with? Senator, I think the biggest challenge perhaps is, is the development piece for the demographics of a very youthful population. 41 percent of the continent is under the age of 15. We've got to find a way to get at education, health care, hopelessness, livelihood and the like in order to give those individuals a future because we could take, we could knock off all the ISIL in Boko Haram this afternoon but by the end of the week, so to speak, those ranks would be filled. We, we know from those who've kind of come out of the forest and given themselves up, so to speak, that the reason they joined was they needed a job, they needed a livelihood. It's not, for the most part, in, th in those regions about ideology. That's not the driver. It's those factors I just talked about that drive them into that line of work because there's nothing else for them to do. So I think the youth bulge and the demographics and providing a development and a way ahead for, that, for those youth are very, very important. So we can't fight our way out of it. What we have to do is try to give them hope and dignity and purpose, I guess. Exactly. I mean, I'm not the first. Many people, especially those in uniform, have said we can't kill our way to victory here. And this is about the long-term investment in capacity building because at the end of the day, that's what's going to try to help solve the problem, especially on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you both for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Votel, thank you for spending the time with me in my office uh, this week. And uh, General Waltz, uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you both for your service. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask this uh, of both of you. One area that uh, I'd like to get your feedback on is foreign, foreign military financing, foreign military sales. To, to what extent do we need to focus on that with some of our partner nations uh, that you believe is helpful to you completing your missions in each of your commands? And General Votel, we'll start with you. Thank you, Senator. I think uh, foreign military funding, foreign military sales are extraordinarily important. You get more uh, into specifics about certain areas where we need to uh, really look at on a more immediate basis. I, I, I do. I think uh, certainly looking at, uh, at ballistic missile capabilities for some of our Gulf partners is an important area. Uh, the, certainly uh, some of the aircraft uh, programs out there, there's a great desire to have uh, U.S. programs in many of these countries, uh, and, uh, and those are certainly areas where we have to pay. A, uh, we have to pay strong. What sort attention. of capabilities in, in the Egypt? Uh, Senator Purdue asked you questions about the Sinai and the increasing uh, threat in that region because of the consolidation of ISIS and other uh, uh, other entities. Uh, what what kinds of things would be helpful in particular to Egypt in that area? Well, certainly um, um, the, the suite of counter-improvised uh, explosive device uh, equipment we have out there running from jammers to protected vehicles and a variety of things in between I think would be extraordinarily helpful to them. Do you have any specifics in general? I want to, General Waldhauser, I want to go to you with the same line of questioning, but uh, any specific things that, that you should uh, that, that you can provide us any specific areas where we need to to take a look at and, and maybe get back to where we're uh, helping build that partnership with Egypt. That's so Senator, critical. from a, from a uh, yeah, we do, and I and uh, I with uh, with your permission, we'll, we'll look for an opportunity to come and talk with you specifically about that, so we can get into some uh, into some detail about what we think would be most useful for Egypt and, and in fact for other partners across the region. Thank you, and General Walhauser, same line of questions. Thank you, Senator. Interestingly, on, in Africa, the foreign military sales is a very interesting uh, choice. Many of the countries that deal with are not financially in, well, in good shape. And consequently, the ability to pay and the ability to, to fund for long-term parts blocks behind that is a difficult task. So I'm not suggesting that we should alter the rules or change the rules, but I think we need to be very flexible when we deal with some of these poor countries and make sure we understand their absorptive capability so that what we're selling them, they not only can use them uh, in the first few years, but there'll be a parts block behind that 
if you will. There'll be an institution, a logistical infrastructure behind that that will allow them to keep these uh, pieces of equipment, whether they be vehicles or maybe C-130 airplanes, keep them in good shape for years to, head, years to come. Thank you. Uh, on another subject, and it, it relates to foreign military aid, we've, uh, General Votel, when you were in my office, we were talking about Afghanistan, and when I was there the year before last, at the time there was a concern that there was going to be a drop-off in uh, foreign investment and the, uh, the tools that Afghanistan needed for its economic uh, development, which is a key part of stabilizing the country. What's the current situation there? I think the situation looks good, uh, both from a NATO standpoint and from a much broader international standpoint. Uh, the uh, donation uh, conferences and other things that have been convened here over the last year. Is it, are we building a reliable stream, or, or is it just is there another cliff that we have to be concerned? I think with we are building a reliable stream out to the 2020 time frame, uh, and in some cases beyond that. Um, so I, I, I think the. Uh, the international community has, has, has stepped up to the plate in this particular area. Thank you. General Waldhauser, when, uh, when General Votel and, our, and the, uh, the people that we have assisting countries and CENTCOM are successful in Mosul and Raqqa, it seems to me that that could, it, it's, the good news is maybe we're getting some level of success there. But I've got to believe that that's going to potentially cause some additional challenges for you. Can you talk about the ones that you're specifically concerned with? Senator, any time you put pressure on the network and disrupt or dislodge ISIL from a certain area, movement will occur. So that means the border countries to where that uh, took place are very concerned about foreign fighters moving back and forth. And so um, that is one of the big concerns that we have. And uh, one of the issues that we have to deal with when we conduct operations, it's important that the neighbors of those countries know what we're trying to do and understand why we're trying to do that so we can help them with the foreign fighter flow if movement should occur. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. Um, the Marine Corps doctrinal publication uh, entitled Strategy has this phrase in it. What matters ultimately in war is strategic success, attainment of our political aims, and the protection of our national interests. History shows that national leaders, both political and military, who fail to understand this relationship sow the seeds for ultimate failure, even when their armed forces achieve initial battlefield success. Battlefield brilliance seldom rescues a bad strategy. I've been heartened by uh, the American uh, military's performance on the battlefield, very heartened with our partners against ISIL in, in Iraq and now Syria. And although we wouldn't want to predict anything about timing, I think that we're going to continue to have battlefield success. What is our political strategy, uh, say, following the fall of Raqqa, that would s lead us to have a belief that there's going to be a, a better uh, next chapter to follow in Syria especially? Senator, I'm not sure I can comment uh, on, on what, the political, uh, what the political strategy is. I, I do believe this is a key aspect of what the, the Secretary Mattis and the administration are discussing right now with respect to what this, uh, what this looks like long term. And General Votel, I think that's a good answer. You, you're not commenting because the political strategy is really for the political leadership, not the military leadership, the administration and Congress. And, uh, you, you understand that Congress has a role in this as well, not just the administration. I, I do, Senator. We are, we are pursuing a war now based on an authorization that was passed in September of 2001. It's now you know, nearly 16 years old. Do you think it would be helpful in terms of articulating a political strategy that would put the military mission into a context and to find an end result and a potential desired future state if Congress were to grapple with the question <clears throat> of the authorities and the and the the this desired end political strategy. Uh, Senator, I, I think the, the current AUMF is, is 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 has provided what we needed, but I do believe an updated uh, updated authorization certainly would send a stronger commitment to uniformed military uh, that of our of our commitment and desire in, to support them. In the CENTCOM space, if we, the military mission succeeds and Raqqa were to fall do you still believe that the American mission against ISIL and al-Qaeda will take a long time? I, 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 I do. I think we, uh, uh, this is a very savvy enemy, and they are adapting. Like we are adapting on the battlefield, they are adapting on Just the like battlefield. like the ISIL attack in, in right. Afghanistan, so, dressed as doctors, attacking the hospital. 
this is a threat that's not going away just because Raqqa were to fall, correct? That's right. I, they will begin to uh, adopt other forms, and we will need to be persistent against that, and we will need to work with our partners to address that in both Iraq and Syria. Well, my colleagues know, because I've said it a lot and others view it the same way, that this question of authorities, I do think it's past time for Congress to address it, whether you think the 9-1401 AUMF legally covers the battle against ISIL or not. Um, I think there's prudent reasons at a minimum, and I think legal reasons as well that we should tackle it. On the question of legal authorities, traditionally need, you need two kinds of legal authorities to be engaged in a military mission. You, you need a domestic legal authority and you need an international legal justification as well. The most common international legal justification for military action in somebody else's territory is that they invited you. We're conducting military actions in Iraq with these request and support of the Iraqi government. We're conducting military operations in Afghanistan with the support and request of the Iraqi government. We just uh, conducted a DOD ground operation for the first time in Yemen with the request and support of the Yemeni government. Are we deploying Marines in Syria at the request or with the permission of the Syrian government? We are not, Senator. What is the international legal justification for the U.S. taking military action in another country without the request of that country. We've criticized nations such as Russia, for example, for undertaking military actions in the Ukraine or Crimea without the request of the government. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I think uh, we, we certainly make a, a judgment about the ability of the government to make a the decision in that case. I think in what we are doing in Syria, we are looking at that as an extension of the, uh, of the authority uh, to operate from, from Iraq. Ir Iraq has had us in and we're cooperating with Iraq. We're there in Iraq at their request. But, but I guess the bottom line is there is no such request from Syria. We don't judge that, cap that government capable of making such a request. We don't really recognize the legitimacy of Bashar al-Assad's government. But um, you are saying that the international legal justification for American military action in a country that hasn't asked us is the fact that we're engaged in a military action in a country next door that has asked us? I, I, I believe we extend. Uh, we are. We are. We are being extended that authority by uh, by our leadership to, to conduct those operations, principally because we are operating against an enemy that operates on both sides of that uh, of that border. If I might, one last question with respect to Yemen. Um, we have ha had hearings in this uh, committee about the ground operation in Yemen, which, to my knowledge, was the first ground operation by DoD forces in Yemen. Um, there were a number of questions raised by that. I don't want to go into the classified briefing we had, but questions about uh, was the mission compromised in some way in the advance? What, what intel was gained? Um, um, was there was some uh, after the fact justification of the mission using video that had actually been taken in another mission? Is the DOD conducting an ongoing investigation uh, of that mission to determine all lessons learned, what worked, what didn't, and what we can do better? Um, Senator, thank you. And let me let me answer this a little more comprehensively. Right. Um, first and foremost, I, I am responsible for this mission. I am the CENTCOM commander, and I'm responsible for what's done in my region and what's not done in my region. So I accept the responsibility for this. We lost a lot on this operation. We lost a valued operator. We had people wounded. We caused civilian casualties. Lost an expensive uh, aircraft. We did gain some valuable information that will be helpful for us. Our intention here was to improve our knowledge against this threat, a threat that poses a, a direct threat to us here in the homeland. Uh, and that was, uh, that was what, we were, what we were focused on. Um, we have, uh, there have been a number of investigations that have been initiated. Uh, m most of these are regulatory or statutory in terms of things that we normally do. I, when an when aircraft is, we lose an aircraft, there is both a safety investigation to ensure that we disseminate lessons learned so for the broader fleet, and then there's also a collateral investigation that tries to determine the specific reason of why that, why that, uh, why that happened and establishes accountability over that. Uh, we have done an investigation into, uh, into the civilian casualties. Uh, that has been completed. The, the helicopter investigations are ongoing. The civilian casualty aspect has been uh, um, uh, has been completed, and we have made a determination based on our best information available that we did cause casualties, somewhere between four and twelve casualties. Uh, that uh, that we we ex we accept responsible. I accept responsibility for. Uh, we have done a line of duty investigation, again a statutory investigation 
on the death of uh, Senior Chief Owens uh, to determine that he was in the line of investigation. The key mechanism that I have, Senator, is, uh, is the after action review. And this is something we do with every operation we do. And the intention here is to, uh, is to uh, review the operation in great detail to understand exactly what happened. And it is done with the chain of command uh, in place. And we have done that, and I have presided over that. Uh, based on my experience, nearly 37 years of, uh, of service, I've certainly appointed a lot of investigations, and I've done, been through a lot of these after-action reviews. When I go through these things, there are some specific things that I am looking for. I am looking for information gaps. Uh, where we can't, uh, we can't explain what happened in a particular situation, or we have conflicting information between members of the organization. I'm looking for indicators of, of uh, incompetence or poor decision making or bad judgment uh, uh, throughout all of this. So what I, can, what I can tell you is that we did an exhaustive after action review on this. I, I presided over that. It was to me. It went down to a level that included people who were on, on the specific objective. As a result of that, uh, I was satisfied that uh, none of those indicators that I identified uh, to you were present. I think we had a good understanding of exactly what happened uh, on this objective, and we've been able to pull lessons learned out of that that we will apply in future operations in the, in the past. And as a result, I made the determination that there was no need for an additional investigation into this particular operation. The investigation that continues is the, the investigation over the loss of the helicopters is still not complete. That, that is correct, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up, General, I... There's been a lot of conversation about this particular mission. And the point that some of us are trying to make that the heroism and sacrifice of those who serve has nothing to do with the mission itself. In other words, we honor their sacrifice no matter what happened in the mission. And when you have women and children killed, as you pointed out, lost for $70 million aircraft. You do not capture anyone as was part of, of the mission. That mission is not a success. But that happens in war. There's a thing called the fog of war. They did the best they could under very difficult circumstances. And I hope in the process of your investigation, when heavy fire was encountered, why the decision was made to continue uh, the mission. I still don't think this committee has an answer uh, to that question. But it does not question the loyalty and sacrifice and bravery when we question the mission. And unless we tell the American people the truth, the absolute truth, then we are going to revisit another war a long time ago where we didn't tell the American people the truth and we paid a very heavy price for it. There's 55,000 names engraved in black granite not far from here. And the American people were not told the truth about whether we were succeeding or failing in that war. And then because of that, it all collapsed. So I hope that we won't forget that lesson and in no way does it detract from the heroism and professionalism and sacrifice of the brave men and women who serve under your command. Senator McCaskill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I couldn't, uh, I just want to underline uh, the comments you just made. And I do think it's important that we get answers to the questions about what happened at that moment um, in very difficult circumstances, admittedly, that heavy fire occurred and the decision was made to continue. Um, and I'm also anxious to have the questions answered about um, the real value of the intelligence that was gathered. I think there has been some mixed signals about the value of the intelligence that was gathered. Uh, I want to talk to you today. I've spent an awful lot of time working on contracting and contingencies. And I remember uh, my very first trip to, F to Iraq uh, included a stop in Kuwait to look at contracting. And I had a, an encounter with a general there that I will never forget. I will always admire him for being so honest with me because I was pointing out all of these massive problems with contracting, especially log cap one, log cap two, and all of uh, th those associated contracts. And, and he looked at me and he said, Senator, 
I wanted three kinds of ice cream in the mess yesterday, and I don't care how much it cost. Now, while I admired him for his honesty, it kind of underscored for me that contracting oversight was not a core capability many times within commands, within contingencies. If it were, we wouldn't have this long trail of mistakes made going all the way back to Kosovo on contracting. So I was upset yesterday when I saw the DODIG report coming out of Kuwait. Um, where they said that ineffective monitoring of contractor performance for the Kuwait base operations, uh, particular concern that the contracting officer representatives, which we've worked very hard, I mean, at the point in time I was over there, it was the worst guy in the unit got handed the clipboard, had no idea what he was supposed to do in terms of contracting oversight, and didn't do much. We've done a lot of work on this, training and making sure people understand, and with standing up the contracting command. So the fact that there is no consistent surveillance of these contracts in Kuwait, um, no assurance that the contract requirements have been met, and the entire $13 million performance bonus was paid, even though it's not clear that it was earned, and maybe most worrisome, this environmental and health hazard that has been allowed to languish, it's fairly clear from reading this report, that a stagnant wastewater lagoon went unresolved, that it was probably never constructed correctly, and it's really impacting the health and safety of some of our men and women that are stationed there. Um, so I, I need you to reassure me that we have not taken our eye off the importance of contracting oversight. And this is not just you. This is also um, the ACC and the 408th Contracting Support Brigade. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you, and I recognize my responsibility as the CENTCOM commander and as a senior leader in the Department of Defense to ensure that the, the expenditure of our national treasure and our resources is done in an effective and efficient uh, manner. And I uh, look forward to an opportunity to talk with you specifically about this situation in Kuwait. I would like that very much, and we'll look forward to hearing from you directly because I want to. The thing that was the most frustrating about the contracting through much of the Iraq conflict before we did the contracting reforms that the Wartime Contracting Commission set out, and we codified all of those, most of them in this committee. Um, it was, um, it, 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 the amount of money that was wasted was astounding, and we just can't afford it. We just can't afford it. Um, let me briefly, in the time I have remaining, um, I know that they have covered uh, Russia as it relates to uh, what's been going on in Afghanistan. Um, I'm not sure that it's been touched on uh, what's going on in Nigeria. Um, and it would love you uh, to speak to that, General Waldhauser, about the fact that we um, refused to sell on the Cobra attack helicopters because of the history of human rights problems. And undeterred by that history, of course, Russia stepped up and now um, sold them attack helicopters and now training the Nigerian military, including the special forces, instead of the United States. Could you um, give us any assessment of the impact of that, that Russia has stepped in where our better judgment said it wasn't a good idea and is now taking on that primary role with the Nigerian special forces? Senator, not only Nigeria, <coughs> excuse me, but other countries on the continent, um, if, it's, if there are easier ways to get to military sales, if countries come in, China, Russia, North Korea, for example, if they come in and don't have a lot of strings attached, then sometimes it's, it's, it's easier for those countries to purchase weapon systems from others than the U.S. So we try to uh, accommodate certain financial situations. I know the DISCA people that work for OSD try hard to accommodate that and really look closely at the absorption capability of these countries. But again, uh, in many occasions, human rights is not an issue when it comes to weapon sales from countries other than the United States. Well, I think it's something we need to worry about because it is a, obviously a powerful way to spread the influence and power of Russia. And I think we all, um, no matter what our party is, have figured out in the last six months that this is a real threat to our country and to our national security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you've been asked about soft power and the need for it. Both of you said it's an important tool in the toolbox to win the war. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Yes, Senator, yes. And uh, your war fighters, uh, extraordinaire. So I appreciate you putting a plug in for soft power. Let me dig in a bit. Can you win the war without it? I don't believe you can, Senator. You can, right. you, you have, everything fault comes from security. Once you have a secure environment, development needs to take place, and that's where soft power kicks in. I, I agree with General Waldhauser. 
So really, this war is about a glorious death being offered by the terrorist and a hopeful life by the rest of the world. Is that a pretty good description of what we're trying to do, is offer a hopeful life to compete with a glorious death? I think in, I think in, in, in very general terms, I think uh, this, it is about that. It is about offering alternatives to people, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, situations right. that they find themselves in. And the good news is that most people over there don't want what ISIL is selling. There's not a big demand for that product. Is that a fair statement? Certainly on the continent, African continent, that's true, very I true. I would agree with that, Senator. Very few fathers and mothers want to turn their daughters over to ISIL if they don't have to. Is that a fair statement? It is, Senator. Yes, Senator, it's fair. Uh, is it a fair statement? We're not going to win this war without partners in the faith. The only way you can win this war is have fellow Muslims fighting with us against ISIL. It, it's my view that, uh, that we have to have local, local forces engaged in this. That's what by, with, and through is all about, Senator. Okay, and is it fair to say that most people in the faith reject, reject this hateful ideology? I, I, that is true, Senator. Okay. I agree. So I want the committee to understand that any budget we pass that guts the State Department's budget, you will never win this war. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> ISIL will be celebrating. Uh, what is Russia trying to do in Libya, General Waldheiser? Senator, Russia is trying to exert influence on the ultimate decision of who becomes and what entity becomes in charge of the government inside Libya. They're working to influence that, that uh, decision. They're trying to do in Libya what they've been doing in uh, Syria? Yes, that's a good way to characterize it. It's not in our national interest to let that happen, is it? It is not. Okay, the political situation in Libya is pretty fractious, fractured. It's very fractured, Senator. So uh, the commander of their military is at odds with the, uh, the political leader supported by the UN. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. And if we don't fix that, it's going to be tough moving forward? We've got to get the entities, specifically Haftar and the government national court, together to make an accommodation in order to get any government moving forward. Would you say that Secretary Tillerson is very important in this regard? Very important, Senator. So we need to put that on his radar screen. We need to, yes, we do. Okay, um, Syria. The Kurds that we're training, General Votel, are they mostly aligned with the YPG? Are they YPG Kurds? They are, Senator. Okay. Is it fair to say that in the eyes of the Turks, the YPG Kurds are not much better, if any better, than the PKK? Senator, that, that is the view of, of, of the Turks. Is it fair to say that the YPG Kurds uh, have a sort of a communist Marxist view of governing. That's what their manifesto says, anyway. Senator, I think I think it's uh, I think it's fair to say that there is some affinity back towards that. So, is it fair to say that we've got to be careful about overutilizing the YPG Kurds? Not only will it create problems for Turkey, uh, other Kurds in the region don't buy into their agenda, also. I think it is. I think it is important, and that is why, as we look to a place like Raqqa, we are attempting to do that with the majority Arab forces. Is it fair to say that how we take Raqqa can determine the outcome of Geneva in terms of a political settlement? I think it is. A, it's certainly a, a key a key operation that will 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 support that. Is it fair to say that the balance of power on the ground, in terms of Assad's regime, and he's in a good spot? He is in a better position than he was a year that ago. That the opposition has basically melted away because Russia, Iran, and Assad have gone after them full, full throated. The support that's been provided by Russia and Iran have certainly enabled the regime. Is it fair to say that most Syrians want two things to get rid of ISIL, but also to get rid of Assad because he slaughtered their families? Um, the, the Syrians that I've talked to, uh, would, I think, would, would, would agree with that. Is it fair to say it's in our national security interest for Damas Damascus not to be handed over to Assad, a proxy for Iran in any final settlement, that you cannot have Iran dominating Damascus? Senator, I think that is, uh, that's a, certainly a decision for our political leadership to make, but it's certainly, uh, I, I, I think there is a strong sense of that way. Final thought. How we take Raqqa will determine if we can get a political settlement in Geneva. If we don't change the balance of military power on the ground, go outside of this Kurdish construct, reassure the Arabs that we're a better partner than we've been in the past, 
we're going to give Damascus, Damascus to the Iranians, if we'll help those Syrian Arabs who want to fight and take their country back from Assad and his brutal dictatorship, I think we can change the balance of power on the ground and get a better deal <clears throat> in Geneva. So if the Trump administration is listening, how you take Raqqa will determine how successful we are in neutralizing Iranian influence and Russia influence. Mr. Chairman, you've been terrific on this issue. I want to thank you for your leadership. I thank you. I thank you, generals, for your appearance here this morning. It's been very helpful to the committee and to the United States Senate. I know it's not your favorite uh, pastime, but I think it's very important that we hear directly from you. We thank you for your leadership, <coughs> and we do want to be sure that We'll do everything we can to support you as we go through what is a very complicated and difficult challenge. Senator Reid? I simply want to thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your service and for your testimony today. And please relay our thanks to the men and women who serve so well with you. Thank you very much. Hearing is adjourned.